Uh, so I would love to open up to Ephesians chapter 6 today. We're going to continue our series. Ephesians 6, Ephesians is toward the end of the Bible. Um, if you need help, grab someone beside you or look it up in the table of contents. Ephesians chapter 6. We've been in a series called A New Thing. When each one of us chooses to submit our lives to God, say, okay, I give up, I surrender. I'm yours, God. I want you to fill me and speak and move in my life. We get baptized and, and give up, really. That's what the gospel is. I'm giving up to God. God wants to take every area of my life and submit it to him. He wants to change the way I look at everything. And this series is a way of looking at these five different relational spheres in our lives where God wants to speak and move inside of those. The first one we talked about is our abiding relationship with Jesus. Me pursuing God in relationship is the most important thing that I can do because it's going to bring life and new luster to every single relationship in my life. My pursuit of Jesus is going to directly impact all of the relationships I have. So we spent a couple weeks on that. The second, second sphere that we see is the church. Some of us have church hurt from the past. Some of us are experiencing it now. Some of us love the church. Wherever we're coming from, we want to have a biblical idea that Jesus is the one who instituted the church. It's his idea. He's the one who created it, and he's the one who's invited us into it so that we can walk out and look like Jesus in the world around us. So the second, we talked about the church. Third, we talked about family, home and family. How do those relationships with our spouses, our kids, relatives, people who just crash on our, our, our couch in the living room or whoever it happens to be, how do those relationships come under God's authority? Uh, the last section of the series, the last few weeks, we talked about the world. How do we interact in a healthy way with people who don't know Jesus? What does that look like? How do we interact in our work? Last week, Chris shared about how we learn to rest well, that your value and your worth is not based on how much labor you produce. It's not based on what you do, but it's based on who God made you to be, that we get to start from a place of rest in our work. Today, we're going to go to the final sphere, and, and I'll tell you, some of you are going to love this sphere. Some of you already do, and you'll just want to talk and talk and talk about it. Some of you don't know what to do with this sphere, and you kind of want to run away from it. Today, we're going to talk ab start talking about the spiritual realms. And when I say that, some of you have heard the term spiritual warfare before. There are actually spiritual forces existing around us that we can't see, all around us, and there is a battle going on that we cannot see. But God has equipped us with ways to engage in that battle in a healthy way. For some of you, you're like, okay, I'm out. Uh, I'm done. You know, I don't know what to do with that. Some of you are like, yes, you're leaning forward. My hope is that today we'll establish a healthy foundation for how we engage in the spiritual realms. Uh, I, I think about, sometimes I think about Christianity and good versus evil, kind of like Star Wars. Anyone else grew up on Star Wars, enjoy, right, ever seen a movie? There's kind of this, this weird tension that they have. It's between the light side of the force and the dark side of the force. And you really never know who's going to win. They're fighting. They're clashing back and forth. I mean, we all hope that the light side's going to win, or at least most of us. Some of you are weird out there, right? But the light side hopefully is going to win, but we never know. And in fact, sometimes at the end of a movie, the light side is not winning. It's the dark side. It's this continual back and forth clash, and we just are uncertain about it. And some of us get this idea of Christianity and following God that that's what it's like. Like sometimes Satan has the upper hand and then Jesus will rally and his people will. And there's like this cosmic clash of light versus dark. But here's the cool thing. And this is great news for many of you if that, that's how you've envisioned it. That is not how it works. Here's the reality. Satan stands no chance against Jesus. Not only does he not stand a chance now, he's already lost. I, I've read the, have you read at the end of the book? Jesus wins. He's on the throne of heaven, not Satan, right? Jesus wins. Not only that, his ultimate victory, the hope we have for the future, it's not based on something that's going to happen. It's based on something that happened 2,000 years ago on a Roman cross and an empty tomb. Jesus already won. The victory that we get, the life we get to live, the victory we have is not a future victory. It's a past and present victory that Jesus wants to work through us. That's what it looks like, spiritual warfare. Because our God saw us and he said, I can take care of that. I'm not putting it on them. I'm not expecting them to be able to do it because they can't. You and I could never, ever have gained salvation for ourselves. And we prove it every day. We're continually failing. We're continually making mistakes. But God said, yeah, I know you can't do it. That's why I'm going to come and do it for you. 
Jesus willingly laid down his life, willingly went through the, the meat grinder that was the cross so that we could experience life now and for eternity. That's the good news that we have. This is not Star Wars. This is the gospel. But here's the thing. Many of you are probably experiencing attention right now because you're like, that's great, but that's not what I'm experiencing right now. If you were honest and were to characterize your life, you would not say that you're experiencing victory. You would not say that it seems like Jesus is ahead. You'd say, no, I'm experiencing depression or anxiety or fear or uncertainty. You're stuck, and you look around the world, and you say, the world's darker and darker every day, it seems like. In all my relationships, there's this struggle and battle and tension that's going on. And so as much as that seems good in theory, in practice, where's the victory? Where, what does that look like, and how do, we, how do we actually walk in it? And the good news is, we can walk in it. God did pave the way and, and gave us very clear instructions on how to do that. So that's where we're going to start. We're going to talk about the armor of God. Uh, we have a guest speaker coming in next week to talk about the armor of God. But we're going to talk about Ephesians chapter 6, the first part of it, laying the foundation. So starting Ephesians 6 verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Okay, stop for a second. Who are we to be strong in? Are you to be strong in yourself? your own efforts, someone else, it's in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. Pretty powerful. One thing that I see Paul doing and wanting to be very clear about is, who's the enemy? Is it people? It is not people. It's not the person who cuts you off in traffic, as much as you think they're the enemy. It's not the coworker who's mad and cusses you out. It's not your children when they're acting up and making life miserable. I was a child. I know. I was good at it, right? It's not your spouse. It's not who fill in the blank. It's none of those relationships. It's not governments and systems. There's a spiritual battle going on. He says it's these forces of evil in the heavenly realms. By the way, when he says heavenly realms, that means the area all around us that we cannot see where there are angels, demons, these, these spiritual forces at work. That's the real battle. And for some of us, that's going to freak us out a little bit because we cannot fight that battle with conventional weapons. We cannot fight that enemy like we would a person. Jesus never intended us to fight the enemy like it was flesh and blood, but to fight the spiritual battle all around us. We have to be able to recognize spiritual battle when we see it. How do we recognize that? Um, I love that Jesus is going to give us some clarity here. Jesus, he's, he's gracious and loving and merciful. He also gets fired up sometimes. Are you aware of that? Like, he gets pretty excited. Sometimes he says some very strong things. In John chapter 8, he's in an argument with the religious leaders. And argument is probably a, a, a light word for it. Like, they're shooting mortars at him, and he's saying some very bold things back. And he's trying to help them identify that actually God the Father is not their father because of how they've lived their lives. And this is what he says. Uh, I, wouldn't, I don't know if I'd try this, but here it is. You belong to your father, the devil. Okay? That's a, that's a strong start. And you, you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So Jesus is coming on a bit strong here, right? What he's trying to do is he's trying to help us identify how do we know if we're walking by God or we're walking by Satan's schemes. There's two things. Number one, he's a murderer, right? He is a murderer. And yes, physical death, absolutely. These, these are some of the people who are going to put Jesus to death. That's part of why he's bringing up this whole murderer thing, right? He's a murderer, but also spiritual death. Satan specializes in that. That depression and anxiety and fear we talked about before. Any sort of darkness, me choosing to live life by my own ways, right? Sin, relational brokenness, all of those, those are signs of spiritual death. When you see those things, recognize Satan is at work. The enemy is at work. You're under spiritual attack, okay? The other thing that's identified here is he's a liar and the father of lies. So much so 
that that's his native language. He can't help it, right? And I wish it was always blatant, like he's like, oh, this guy's purple, or something like that, right? We'd be able to identify it immediately. But the ways that he lies are a lot more subtle most of the time. Now, try this one on for size. Some of you have experienced this before. Here's, here's a form that his lies can take. You are damaged goods. You are too far gone. You've done too many things. You've made too many mistakes. How could God love you after all of that? Just list out all the things that you've done, right? Like, how in the world could God continue to forgive you, continue to use you, continue to love you? That's not possible, right? Give up. Just mail it in, right? God will not be a part of your life. Have, have any of you experienced any of those before? And it's a lie that's very clever because he's stacking up evidence against you. Does anyone know what Satan means? It's a Hebrew word, shatan, and it means accuser. He's the accuser of the brethren of us. He's going to come and he's going to try to accuse you over and over and over again. That's what he's good at. That's his native language. He's going to say, here's all the evidence, evidence against you, which seems so compelling because it's all true, right? And it, but then he's going to draw a false conclusion. Because of this, there's no way an eternally loving, pure, holy, beautiful God could love you, could use you, could value you. He does the same thing to Jesus. He says, hey, why don't you just, just turn those stones into bread, right? Like, you can do it. It's totally within your power. Three times he's going to tempt Jesus to step, overlook or step past the truth of God's word. We can always identify him by his lies. How do we know what his lies are? Well, here's a great answer right here. This is the truth. God has given us this, all 1,189 chapters of truth, so that we can learn it and love it and live it. Guess how Jesus confronted Satan in that moment? If I was him, I'd squish him like a bug, right? Because like, lion of the tribe of Judah. But like a lamb that was slain, he just quoted scripture at him. It is written, it is written, it is written. We have to counter Satan's lies with the truth, with the truth of God's word. He is the liar and the fathers of lies. So when you see murder, death, spiritual death, physical death, when you see deceit, you know that that's a spiritual attack. There's a battle going on around you, and you're not helpless against it. Uh, there, there's one more passage I want to look at, because that's all well and fine, uh, but how do we actually walk that out? How do we actually live this way when there's a spiritual battle going on and we're physical beings? We're not just physical beings. We're also spiritual beings, but how do we impact that? How do we walk this li and live this life? Paul's going to help us out in Romans chapter 8, but first in Romans 7, he, he starts this really powerful argument, and again, tell me if you if, if this sounds like you at all. He says, okay, I know that God has given us these good and perfect things to do. So many wonderful things in God's word. He's given us all of this, and I want to do it. I want to do what he's asked me to do. But as soon as I commit myself to doing it, as soon as I have the opportunity, I go and I do exactly the opposite thing. As soon as I can, right, I go and I sin. And he's like, and I don't get it. It's like, temporary insanity. That's what I think of it as, right? Like, I know I want to do the right thing, but when presented with the wrong option, it is so easy for me just to go right down that path. And over and over and over again, what do I do with this? And he, he kind of gets to this place where I felt this, and many of you probably have too. He says this, wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? He's so frustrated and, and so broken by all of this. But then he says something really powerful. He says, thanks be to God through Christ Jesus, our Lord. See, how good were you at holding yourself to God's standards, at living the kind of life he'd called you to before you, you chose to follow Jesus? Were you pretty good at it? Or were you, like me, absolutely awful at it, right? I didn't have what it took. I didn't have the ability. I didn't have the strength. I didn't have the courage. I didn't have the confidence. I failed over and over again. What makes me think that I'm going to do better on my own now? I'm not, I'm not the one who can do that. What Paul recognized is Jesus, who Hebrews is going to say, was tempted in every way just as you and I are, but he was without sin. Jesus living about 35 years, right, never once committed a single sin. He did it flawlessly. Paul's saying, I'm a wretched man. Who's going to rescue me? Only Christ Jesus. Why? Because he lived it perfectly. Never once did he fail. He's the only one who that can be said of. 
Romans 8, he's going to start out saying there's no condemnation for us, even though we fall into these sins. But then he's going to, in verse 5, he's going to start to illuminate to us how we live this life. He says this, those who live according to the flesh, which is a very weird thing to say, right? This word flesh, it, it really means the sin nature. We're all born with this proclivity towards sin that we're just going to run after sin. And it stays with us even after we choose to follow Jesus and surrender our lives to him. It's going to stay there. And he says, we have this flesh that's still inside of us. He says, those who live according to it have their minds set on what that flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. That, of course, is talking about God's spirit. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. And just to pause for a moment here, think back to Romans 7, that chaos of, I want to do the right thing, but then sin's right there and it drags me away. All of this is happening on. When we try to fight against sin and against Satan by using our own strength and our own willpower and our own ability, we're going to get owned every time. And here's why. Because by doing it that way, by relying on myself, I'm allowing the flesh to, to try to help me out. And it says it cannot do it. It cannot win. I love Jeremiah 17 is going to say, cursed is the one who depends on man's strength. It's like a bush in the wasteland, like a, a dry, prickly desert bush. That's what we look like. We cannot depend on ourself, on our flesh, on our sin nature to accomplish the things of God. It's impossible. Fortunately, it's about, the, the tone is about to turn here, right? He says, those who are in the realm of flesh cannot please God. You, however, that's a good, that's a good, good uh, word right there, however, right? You are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. If you've turned your life over to Jesus, you've said yes to Jesus, no to yourself. Like, I confess, I cannot live this life. I'm a sinner, God. I need you so desperately. You get baptized. God sends his spirit to live inside of you. The God who created the universe, who spoke it into existence, said, yeah, I'm going to come and I'm going to live in your, in your heart. I'm going to kick the furniture aside, you know, kick my feet up on the, the coffee table, and I'm going to take up residence inside of your heart. God lives inside of you if you've chosen to follow Jesus. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. The entire power of the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you and inside of me. That's how we defeat the enemy. That's how we live the kind of life God has called us to. And here's the amazing thing about this, looking at this, is you and I actually have a lot of control over how the spiritual battle is going to go. Because we get to pick. Are we going to give in to Satan and his attacks? Are we just going to roll over and, and let him run with us? Or are we going to choose to trust the Spirit of God and submit to his leadership so that he can work and speak and move in our lives? We get to pick. In every moment, we get to pick. And the enemy cannot force us to pick his way. That's got to be encouraging to a lot of us there that there is, there is power in submitting to the Spirit's leadership. So I want to look at a couple really practical points. How do we actually begin to do this? How do we set ourselves up to win and not, not to lose? If you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, stop giving the enemy power. Did you know the enemy, Satan, only has as much power as you give him? I, he can't force himself in there because remember, who's living inside of you? God, God's spirit is living inside of you, right? Satan can't just force his way and, and do things his way without our consent. The only power he has is what I open myself up to, what I expose myself to and give to him. That's the power he has, which might be a scary thought if you're like suffering from huge anxiety or, or stuck in some sort of a habitual sin or something. You've given him access and influence in your life. But just as you can give him access, you can also deny him access. You can shut that door. You can run away from him and from what he's doing. And, uh, and what I love is in John, 1 John chapter 4, John's talking about there's these false prophets all around, and they're going to try to deceive people in the church. They're gonna, someone's going to give them a microphone, and they're going to speak all sorts of blasphemies and lies and those sorts of things. But here's what he says. He says, you, dear children, are from God, and you have overcome them, these false prophets. Why? 
Because the one who is in you, who's the one who's in you? God's spirit, right? The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Remember, this is not Star Wars. God's spirit completely defeats Satan every single time. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You do not have to give Satan any sort of influence or power in your life. He only comes in if you give him that opportunity. Remember, Jesus won. He already did. I I can imagine Satan looking at the cross and seeing Jesus being nailed there and just gloating and, and feeling triumphant. Yes, I took him down. But here's the crazy thing. That was part of God's plan all along. As much as Satan worked, as much as he fought against God, what did he do? He accomplished exactly what God wanted to do in the first place. Satan cannot win. God always wins. We can step into that victory by not giving Satan access to us. I have to identify the battle I'm in. And and there's unhealthy extremes to this as well. I give Satan power when on one side I say, yeah, I don't like the idea of angels and demons and I don't understand that and I I just don't like that. And I'm going to pretend like they don't exist and like this is all physical and, and I can do it this way, right? Here's the problem with that. Do you know who in scripture spoke the most about demonic activities and influences out of everyone in scripture? Jesus. He's the one who acknowledged them the most. He was the one who was most in tune with what was going on. He's casting out demons. He's speaking on how they work and act. I can't just close my eyes and pretend like it's not there, right? Because then I'm totally vulnerable to attack. That's dangerous. Satan likes to convince us that he's not really there. He's not really working that, oh yeah, it's, you, you can just live your life your way. On the other side, there are people who are super passionate about this. And I know some of you are these people, and I love that you are passionate. But there's an unhealthy extreme over there, too, to where there's a demon crouching behind every rock, right? Like, they're everywhere, and I can see them, and they're influencing. And and what ends up happening a lot of times is we become so fixated on Satan and demons that we're no longer really focused on the gospel of Jesus. How ironic is that, right? I'm so fixated on the evil that I'm not able to be Jesus' hands and feet and an agent of good wherever I go. I need to find a healthy balance where I recognize that there is a spiritual battle and it's raging all around us, but that I'm not focused so much on the realm of evil that I'm able to be Jesus' hands and feet in my neighborhoods and my families where I'm at. Are you tracking with me? We gotta have a healthy balance with this sort of thing. Recognize the battle, but don't give Satan too much power in that. Because if I'm just focused on him, I'm going to lose immediately, okay? So don't, don't focus on the wrong things. How do I stop giving the enemy power? Scripture here, is, Paul is going to say, put on the full armor of God. Every piece. There are seven of them, and uh, I, I'm not sure what's going to be preached next week because I'm not helping write it, but uh, hopefully he's going to cover a lot of it. My encouragement to you, go and read the passage, the rest of it. The armor is amazing that God has already given us and equipped us with everything we, ne- we need to win this fight. The armor is there. Put it on. Not just pieces of it, right? Like, oh, I just want to put on the helmet today. How's that going to work in battle? It's not, right? I need to put on the full armor of God. Uh, I, I, think about, I think about this. A- another way that I give Satan power in my life, and this happens a lot, and we've already kind of touched on it, is when I depend on myself for strength, when I'm relying on my own efforts and my own abilities. And I, I heard a story years ago that has stuck with me that's been a really power, powerful way of me really grasping a hold of what's being said here. And, and here's how the story goes. Imagine with me that you suddenly get your dream car, whatever that is, right? Whatever it is for you. For me, I love 1965 Mustangs, right? Like a cherry red Mustang. It's delivered to my house, to your house. And I'm so excited because I want to show my Mustang to the staff team here, right, where, where I'm at work, and it's going to be so good. And I get up early in the morning, and I, I do my morning stuff, and I, I stretch out and do, do some calisthenics, and then I go out there, and I get behind the bumper of that car, and I just start pushing, right? I go out my driveway and turn, turn around, and I, I, I'm going along at a pretty good clip. Uh, good clip as in, like, two miles per hour, right? But I'm going. I'm going somewhere, and it's working. But then I hit a, a stretch of road that has a, not, not like a hill hill, but a, a slight incline. And that slight incline just totally defeats me. I can't get up that. I, I'm pushing as hard as I can. I can get a little headway, but then it immediately rolls back because it outweighs me significantly, right? And I'm pushing and straining, and finally, red in the face, out of breath, I just sit on the trunk of the car, frustrated. I, I regain my breath, and I decide I'm just going to walk to work. And on the way back home, I get behind my Mustang, and I push it back home into my driveway. And as I'm going to bed, I'm just at my wit's end, right? Like, man, 
why was that so hard? Tell you what, I'm going to get up even earlier. I'm going to stretch even more thoroughly, and I'm actually going to do some pull-ups and some push-ups and some sit-ups today, strengthen my core. It's going to be great, right? Tomorrow is the day. But guess what happens in the morning? I get going, I get moving, I hit that incline again, and I'm totally defeated by it once more. And this time I'm really frustrated, sitting on the back of my car, and a guy walks by and he's like, hey, are you having trouble pushing your car? I said, yeah, I, I'm doing my best, but I just can't get it up this hill. He's like, hey, I've got a great news for you. We have this seminar at church this week about how to push your car appropriately, right? How to get the right leverage with your feet and get under it, right? The right kind of stretches to do in the morning, how to strengthen your abs and your biceps and your legs, all the right workouts that you can do so that you can successfully push your car. And I'm like, awesome, let's do it. So I go to work, come back, and that weekend, I go to the seminar, and man, the information is stellar. They have charismatic speakers. It's wonderful, right? And Monday comes around, and I'm pumped Today is the day. We're going to get there. Uh, and I, I've been practicing these. And so I get behind my car and I start pushing. And I get to that incline again. I'm like, today's the day. We're going to do it. And I start pushing. I get, I get farther up it. But then I realize the incline's like a half mile long. And I get a little farther. And by a little farther, I mean maybe a few feet farther. I had a good tailwind today, right? I get a little farther. And then it just rolls back. And I'm right back at square one. And I'm at my wit's end. What's, I got this car, and I love this car, and I want to use this car and show everyone this car, but it's not working. Well, suddenly a guy drives up in a car and parks in front of me, and he gets out and comes back and says, hey, buddy, what's going on? How you doing? Right? Like, I see you pushing your car. Did you run out of gas? I'm like, no, no, I'm just trying to get to work. He's like, hey, let me show you something. He opens the driver's door, pops the, tr pops the hood, opens it up, says, look in there. You see that thing in there? That's called an engine, right? An engine. The manufacturer of this beautiful Mustang actually put everything the car needs to run right there. All you have to do is get in, turn the key, and push the gas. And it was amazing. I finally got to show my car off to my coworkers, right? I finally got there. Now, this story is totally ridiculous. I'm watching a lot of you laugh and rolling your eyes, and right? Here's the thing. Spiritually, when I try to live the life that God's called me to do by my own strength, by my own power, I'm pushing my car. You're pushing your car. We're doing the exact same thing, as crazy and ridiculous as that sounds. That's exactly how ridiculous it, is, ridiculous it is spiritually to try to live this life God's called you to live by your own power. You've got an engine under the hood. His name is the Holy Spirit. God has given you his spirit to do every, accomplish everything God has called you to do. He's the power source. And I give Satan power when I say, I've got this. Step aside, God. I can do this now. God wants to partner with you. He wants to bring his spirit to bear and partner with you and teach you how to live the kind of life he's called you to live. Stop pushing your car. Stop giving Satan power. You tracking with me? You with me here? Okay, cool. Second thing, we need to learn to stand firm in Christ. Stand firm in Christ. You probably heard it. Paul said it three times in that passage we read, stand firm. In fact, it, it ends with the word stand firm. And then the very next verse that we didn't read starts with stand firm then right? Over and over again, stand firm, stand firm, stand firm. Don't run away. Don't walk away. How do we stand firm? We do it in Christ. Remember, Paul says, who will rescue me from this body of death? Christ Jesus, our Lord. He's the one who can do it. Remember how Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 started? It's the Lord's strength. It's the Lord's power that we need to have working in us and through us. I can stand firm I also need to have my armor on. Imagine if you're prepared to stand firm, but you have no armor on in the middle of battle. How long is that going to last? How well is that going to go? That's delusional, right? That I, I think I can actually win this fight and stand firm without the armor that's going to protect me from the attacks that are coming my way. I need to have my armor on as well to stand firm. And God has given us everything we need. Will we rest in it? I love Hebrews chapter 12 is going to say, here, here's how you live a life of faith. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorn, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. Look to him. He shows us how to live this life. He's the one who knows. He's the one who gives us the power and the ability and the understanding of how to live this life. Fix your eyes on him. One of the things that I've been learning recently, this is something I have not been good at lately that God's been really challenging me on, is my perception of the gospel. 
my perception of the gospel, there's a, there's a pastor on the East Coast named J.D. Greer. He wrote a book, and he kind of uses this analogy. He says, a lot of us, we see the gospel as the diving board into the pool, right? We're going to walk out on it, and we're going to jump into the pool. And the pool would be the rest of your life, right? Like maybe eternity and how you're going to live your life and your family and your job and your finances and all these things. That's the pool, right? We're going to j- use the gospel to jump into the pool of God's blessing and what he's called us to do. But the problem happens when we get in there. Notice a lot of those things can be very self-centered. It's about me. There's, it's easy to drift from Jesus' mission. What J.D. Greer says is the diving board is not the gospel. The pool is the gospel. The, the phrase God's just brought to my heart so much recently is to marinate in the gospel. Immerse myself in in the gospel. It's really easy for those of us who've been following Jesus for a long time to think, okay, the gospel, that, that's kid stuff, right? That's when I started. I'm ready to move on to bigger and better things. There is no bigger and better thing than the gospel of Jesus Christ. There, we don't move past it. We slip more into it. We become more immersed in it. Jesus wants to do new and more powerful things through the gospel. And what's happened as, as I focused on the gospel is a lot of these problems or challenges or stressors of life that I've been dealing with, they just kind of fade away. The gospel gets my heart recentered on the mission of God. It builds a passion in my heart for his kingdom, for you, for people outside of this church. All of a sudden, everything that God wanted me to do is made so clear and so accessible when I just focus on the gospel. And what, what I've been doing is every morning, spending a time in my prayer, meditating on an aspect of the gospel. What is it today? God, it's that you stepped in and you took the penalty of my sin for me. Thank you, God. If you don't even know where to start, if you're like, man, I love the idea of the gospel. I just don't know how to vocalize it or talk about it. Romans or Hebrews, spend some time in one of those two books and slow roll it through those books and just allow God's heart, his word to penetrate your heart and change the way you think about things. See, the more I'm immersed in the gospel, the more I'm able to stand firm in the conviction that we serve a good God who loved us and has plans for the rest of our lives that include us being part of his kingdom. See, God wants us to stand firm. He wants us to give no quarter to Satan. I love being a part of this group of people. As I'm looking out there, I know so many of you, and I'm so thankful for the way that you are wholeheartedly pursuing Jesus. I love that at real life, we're not perfect. We've got issues because we're all in progress too, right? But I love how there's this huge awakening among people who come here. We baptize people all the time, almost every week. We baptize 24 people in the month of May alone. That's God's work powerfully. And that's you taking this seriously and saying, I'm going to share Jesus with the people around me. God is working powerfully through this church. But what I think about is I also talk to a lot of you and recognize there is stress and distraction and worry and fear and doubt and discouragement that are plaguing your hearts. I recognize that life is challenging and difficult. If we can learn, if we can learn how to fight this new war that we're in, this spiritual battle all around us, not fighting like we're fighting against people, but against Satan and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Imagine what God could do with us. Did you know that Jesus said, hey, you're my church the gates of hell can't prevail against you. Satan and his kingdom cannot defeat Jesus' church. And what I love about that is a gate doesn't advance. It doesn't move. It stays put. Jesus is calling us to storm the gates of hell and saying the gates of hell have no option but to cave right in front of you. See, Satan has no power here. I think about our city. I think about the strongholds here in Spokane. There are a lot of people who are just very self-satisfied with their lives, doing their own thing. That's spiritual death. God has invited us to so much more. Did you know Spokane is actually a through point for a lot of sex trafficking and drugs? I I talk to Border Patrol agents about this all the time. From Seattle, we're the straight hub to the eastern United States. There's so much. At some of the, the hotels downtown, every day there are people being trafficked there. This city has a lot of dark places. Homelessness has increased, right? There's a lot of strife and discord. And what I love is that we're all here. Why do you think we're here in Spokane? Have you ever thought about that? Why did God put you here? It's because there's some gates that need storming. Because there's some darkness that needs the light of Jesus Christ shined inside of it. And God put you here and me here so that we can do that. And he says, they won't prevail against you. 
They cannot stand against God's people who are on mission with him, who are fighting this spiritual battle with the weapons and armor that God has provided. Spokane has no chance against the light of Jesus Christ. And I look at the 11 disciples of Jesus after he ascended to heaven, and I see the impact that they made on the world. That all, There's over 2 billion people today who believe because of those 11 people. And I look at all of you, and I think, what could we do? What could God do, more importantly, through this group of people? There's darkness that doesn't stand a chance. Now, some of you in this room, you don't know Jesus. You never have. You've never chosen to follow him. You're in a lot of danger. Danger number one, in this life, you have zero power to fight the enemy. You have zero power to affect all of these spiritual things because it's only the Spirit of God who can defeat him. You're vulnerable. There's an eternity of separation from God at stake in a real place called hell that God came specifically so you wouldn't have to go there. God is inviting you. He wants you to be a part of his kingdom, to experience the freedom and joy that come in Christ Jesus through the gospel. His invitation to you today is to say, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day for you to follow him. If that's you, your next step is to get baptized. We'll have a team in the back with shirt, shorts, towels, everything you need to take that first step of obedience to God. For the rest of us, my invitation is to take this. And if, if we just come and listen to a sermon on Sunday, and I'm in danger of doing this too, that'd be really weird if I'm speaking, but I'm in danger of doing this, to come and listen to a sermon, and then to walk away and say, hey, that was great, that was good, and go home and do nothing about it. You've just wasted your time. God wants to do things. We get up here and we talk about these things because we love you and we really want to be the kingdom of God. We want heaven unleashed on earth and we can do that. Why? Not because we're awesome, but because the spirit of God living inside of us can and will do it. Let's pray. God, we're so thankful that you went way ahead of us, how you saw us before you even created the world, before the foundation of the world. You looked at us you loved us. You said that we're going to be holy and blameless in your sight. It says, in love, you predestined us to be adopted as your sons and daughters. You chose us long before we would have ever thought of choosing you. God, thank you for the power of your love. Thank you for what you've done in us. Thank you that you have not left us vulnerable like sheep without a shepherd, helpless and hopeless in a world where there's an enemy prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Thank you, God, that you've given us everything we need to actually triumph and experience victory in our lives. Help us, God. We need you. We're so desperate for your spirit to come and fill us and move through us and help us experience that victory that you promised. God, we submit ourselves to you and ask that you would shake the enemy's strongholds in Spokane, that you would reach the world for Jesus one person at a time through us. God, we surrender to you. We love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can stand. We're going to continue worship. If your next step is to get baptized, you can head to the back right now.